Hello there, my name is Deborah Collins. Welcome to Going Strong, a program that celebrates this wonderful province we call home. Each week, I'm speaking with someone who's made a contribution to a culture that is one of the most vibrant in the world. It's a culture that is unique and going strong. And those two things certainly apply to my guest today. He is one of Newfoundland's most passionate visual artists, who can often be found painting by a river, a peaceful cove, or a rugged coastline. He's a lover of the Newfoundland pony, so maybe it should come as no surprise he's been spotted driving around Trinity Bay in a horse and buggy. And he loves to tell a good story. He is Clifford George, and I'm delighted to welcome to the VOWR studio. Hello, Clifford. Hello, David. Long time no see. Long time no see. It is so good. I'm looking forward to this chat. Yeah, so am I. And I'd like to start at the beginning. Um... Just briefly, where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in Markland, raised in Whiteway, Trinity Bay. That's where I grew up. And I went to school in Greens Harbor. Yeah. yeah. So you truly have salt water in your blood. Salt water in my blood, the veins and everything. Yeah, <laughs> kelp in the works. <laughs> kelp and everything, yeah. Now, oh, I'm from the high water mark. The high water mark. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff on the high water mark. Yes, yes. Well, if you're any proof, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, I got you figured, Clifford, for one of those kids who was always drawing or sketching, you know, from an early age. In fact, I heard you used to paint on your mother's floor. Now, is there any truth to that? Yeah, that's true. I used to have uh, paper and scribbling and scribblers and everything, and I always be drawn all the time. I don't know why, but th- that was my passion. Yeah. I knew that was my passion. Yeah, yeah. the ducks and the horses and stuff in the community when I was a little boy. Yeah. Now, what did your family think of that? Other than your mother being concerned, perhaps, about the floor. No, no, my mother was happy about me doing my work. All her life, she was happy for me. And my father was, too. Mm. And my grandfather, especially, because he inspired me more than anyone. Yeah. He used to take my little sketches in his lunch can, take them to work and show the co-workers on the highways. Amazing. He'd come back and say, boy, Clifford, boy, you did some job on Superman and Havilland Cassidy. <laughs> so, so you were a source of pride right from the get-go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Best yeah. inspiration you can get is from your own family. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And just briefly, I mean, you come by it honestly because your dad was a great folk artist. Yeah. My father carved the whole history of the fishery in Newfoundland in, in wood and painted it all and had a show in New York. Wow. I didn't even know he was an artist. He had another one at uh, Memorial University, too. Yeah. So that creative spark and spirit and ability was is in your family. Yeah. yeah. And my yeah. brother paints, too. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, now, when you were growing up in a, in a small rural community in Newfoundland, I mean, was making art for a living something that was considered realistic or no, unrealistic? No, people told me I, I was going to end up in the poorhouse and all that kind of stuff. I kept on drawing and painting. No money in that much, obviously. You're going to be in some attic being a poor man and all that kind of stuff. Now, I guess you showed them, but now in the meantime, you you didn't go at it full-time for a while. I mean, you, you had other careers. Yeah. You, you lived here in St. John's. You were a medical yeah. illustrator at, at the university's medical school. Yeah, I enjoyed that job. That, that was uh, uplifting because I worked with the pioneers who came here to teach medicine, and I did all their scientific drawings and their scientific research for them, and abstracts and displays for them to take to other countries to show what they were doing with their research here. So a medical illustrator, so you were actually drawing parts of the body for, for I did anatomy? I did the whole, the, whole, the whole neuroanatomy book. I did all the drawings for it. I did many drawings of operations and everything. And they used I could do any colostomy with a pencil. <laughs> so Hannah told me that. <laughs> a colostomy with a pencil. I could do any colostomy. I could tell your stomach, you got to take it out, put pieces in, take pieces out and everything. Yeah. According yeah. to what I'm told, I had to draw all that for publication, you see. Yeah. You had a strong stomach, I'd yeah. say, because you were well, painting. Well, I developed things. a strong stomach. But I don't know why I haven't got this problem with all the formaldehyde I smelled. Oh my God, that was terrible. Yes, everything would have been preserved. Well, see, uh, the C. Scoops came here to teach open heart surgery. And C. taught Kevin Melvin, because Kevin Melvin, Dr. Melvin, told me the other day, he said, really, you know, Clifford, he said, he was my mentor. He taught me, and now I taught all the other students, and I'm leaving. Just imagine all the years gone by. Yes. I was only a young man when I went to medical school. Yeah, yeah. 
And the best part of Linda was the fact that I could get lots of money from my salary to buy paints and paint, do paintings, and then I'd be walking down the hallway with my portfolio, and the doctors would say, what you got in that portfolio today, boy? So I'd show them, and they'd buy me work. Great place to sell art. Oh, my goodness. So you Still were, is. You were helping out with the medical research and the medical teaching, but you were also able to, to finance your, your artwork. I yeah, mean, that was the best part of it, yeah. getting enough money to buy as much paint as I wanted. Yes. Yeah. You also did a fair bit of sketching of the Newfoundland Pony, which, of course, years ago was under a real threat of extinction. What was it about the Newfoundland Pony that drew your attention? Well, the Newfoundland Pony is responsible for our lives, really. People used to get Newfoundland ponies to bring out their logs to build houses. And all the logs for sawmills and everything was brought up by ponies. Far wood, longer for the flake and everything like that. So I got tremendous respect for the Newfoundland pony because my father gave me a Newfoundland pony when I was 14. What was his name? Topper. And I kept him as a stallion. But that's another story. Yeah. That's a really a good story. Yeah. But it'll take forever to tell it. <laughs> well, I can tell. I mean, the glint in your eyes. So you loved you see, that. But, do- but when that I, when do- I was in the oh. medical school, I met Dr. Andrew Fraser, you see. And he said, uh, the drawings you're doing on the Newfoundland ponies, why don't we get together and write a book? So I let it go, and I kept drawing pictures. One day I walked into his office because I didn't see him that often, and uh, we were on Shirley Newark show. And she said, what inspired the two of you to do the Newfoundland pony? And Dr. Fraser said, well, Cliff George came down to my office and said, when are we going to write that book you're talking about? And he said, we wrote our first book yeah. to save the Newfoundland pony. Beautiful, beautiful. And you love that topper. Was he one of the sketches? Yeah, he was in the book a lot. He was, I guess so. There's a story about him in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And what a way to combine initially, you know, a medical career with your love of painting, but then also to, to dedicate your skill and your talent to, to a really worthy cause because the pony was really under threat. To I mean, me, you see, I was doing sketches of the pony because they were going to be obsolete. In 1984 and 87, there were 4,000 ponies in Newfoundland. 1997, there was 500. In 1992, it was down to the critical stage, it was just above 60. So our, our involvement with the Newfoundland Pony at that time saved the Newfoundland Pony. Yes. You know, from extinction. Yeah. Two of us didn't buddy up, it never would have happened. Because a lot of people would not have been aware that the, no. that the pony was, was nearing extinction. No, they've got a great registry now for the Newfoundland Ponies. Yeah. But they're still in need because the, the registry is closed to the other Newfoundland Ponies that are out there because they're different stock. But there's Newfoundland ponies here now in Newfoundland that are not registered in these protection. Mm. Yeah. Also, you know. Yeah, well, I, and I can see if Clifford George has anything to do with it. I'm after having something to do with it already. You, yes, I, I wouldn't I be I consider myself surprised. an activist. Yes. When it comes to the pony. Yes, and that's I dedicate what, my life to saving the pony. Which is what was needed. Yeah. And you obviously love horses and ponies, and you love to ride. Not necessarily on horseback. I've seen pictures of you yeah. driving around in a, in a horse and buggy. Well, my father and I made horse and buggies. And I loved to hook up the horse and go from one community to the other, you see. When I was a boy, that's how it, that was my transportation. I went to see my grandfather in Greenside. One time I crossed the harbour on ice with my Newfoundland pony over to visit my grandfather. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that seems like an absolutely perfect way to segue into the first song that we're going to play. It was a request of yours. It is about a horse who got in trouble on the ice, and it was uh, written by a man by the name of Mark Walker around, uh, you know, early yeah. 1900s. It was he, sang by Elmer Blondell, too. The original, yeah. exactly, that's right. The song is called Tickle Cove Pond. This horse was immortalized in music, like you immortalized yeah. them on, on a sketch pad. Why do you like this song so much? I like this song because it's uh, they saved the pony from going through the ice, you see. My father used to tell me stories about women in the lumber woods with big horses, and they lose them in the ponds with a load of wood on them. And he said they'd jump them at the pond. He used to explain to me how they got them back on the ponds, you know, same way they did in that song. So when I listened to that song, I listened to my father tell me about the days in the lumber woods. Wonderful. Well, we're going to have a listen to it now. Tickle Cove Pond. In cotton and hauling, in frost and in snow, we're up against troubles that few people know. And it's only by courage and patience and grit and neat and plain food that we keep ourselves fit. The hard and the easy we take as it comes. When ponds freeze over, we shorten our runs. For to hurry me haulin' the spring come the non Nearly lost me a mare out on Tickle Cove Pond Lay hold William Olford, lay hold William White Lay hold of the cordage and 
pull all your might. Lay hold of the bowlin and pull all you can, and give me a lift with poor kid on the pond. Well, I knew that the ice became weaker each day, but still took the risk and kept hauling away. One evening in April, bound home with a load, the mare showed some halting against the ice road. She knew more than I did, as matters turned out, and lucky for me, had I joined her in doubt. She turned round her head and with tears in her eyes, as if she were saying, "You're risking our lives." All this I ignored with the whip handle blow, for man is too stupid, dumb creatures to know. The very next minute, the pond gave a sigh, and down to our necks my poor kitty and I. For if I had taken wise kitty's advice, I never would take the shortcut on the ice. Poor creature, she's dead, and poor creature, she's gone. I'll ne'er get my bear out of Tickle Cove Pond. Lay hold, William Olfer. Lay hold, William White. Lay hold of the cordage and pull all your might. Lay hold of the bowlin and pull all you can, and give me a lift with poor kid on the pond. I raised an alarm you could hear for a mile. The neighbors turned up in a very short while. You can always rely on the Olfords and Whites to render assistance in all your bad plights. To help a poor neighbor was part of their lives. The same I just say for their children and wives. When the bowlin was fastened around the mare's breast, William White for a shanty song made a request. There was no time for thinking, no time for delay. So straight from his head came the song right away. Lay hold, William Olfer. Lay hold, William White. Lay hold of the cordage and pull all your might. Lay hold of the bowlin and pull all you can. And with that, we brought Kit out of Tickle Cove Pond. And that song, Tickle Cove Pond, was requested by Clifford George, a Newfoundland artist and my guest today on Going Strong. And you know you are with a passionate artist when you see him listening to the song like that and actually sketching the scene that we're hearing about in the song. And Clifford, as we were listening to that song, actually sketched the horse on the pond. That is amazing. Clifford, when you retired from Memorial University, uh, you moved back to Trinity Bay, and of course you pursued your painting full time. Um, I'm curious, you're so known for these, were you always drawn to landscapes and seascapes? Is that where your artistic heart is? Well, see, if I'm driving around Newfoundland and I see something, it inspires me to paint, I just got to paint it, you know. I love the bogs and the little valleys because they speak back to you, and the old Newfoundland houses and the backyards and everything, it's like when I was growing up, you see. Yeah. So I just keep painting, and uh, every day is a new a new painting, and then I, I more or less abandon the painting and put it to one side and start another one. That's what keeps me going. Now, when the bogs speak to you, what do they say? Silence, and then more silence when the crickets hesitate. Silence, and then more silence. You hear the whispers of the birds, the croaking of the frogs. I, pe- I was by a bog the wood this week in Hopa, and the little sterns were there flying on the rocks, and the sandpipers were digging in the bog. And they were all around me, and I got to hear the frogs and everything. It was part of the painting I was doing. Yeah. They were my theater. Yeah. My, my part, of, part of my life. Yeah. And sometimes there's more to be said by silence or by a pause than a million words, you know? When you're able to sit in the stillness, then you're able to hear. You hear your own brush strokes. Yes. You know, that's all you got is your brush strokes and the pond in front of you and everything and the clouds. And the clouds whisking by. Yeah. You wonder which one you want to catch in your painting. <laughs> and pretty soon it's gone, boy, and you got to wait for another one. Yeah. Or you don't put on in at all. So that's, the nature itself teaches you how to paint. How so? Because it speaks to you. If you're an artist and you, and you know how to paint. I'm an impressionist because i got to capture things as they go by, you know. Mm-hmm. 
fast and furious and mm. get it out of my system. I was over in Spoon Cove two weeks ago. Spoon Cove was over in Island Cove. Down there in that little cove, my God, that was a magical place. Yeah. The yeah. whole little cove was magical, Island yeah. Cove. Yeah. With the little shacks and the houses and the, and the sea coming in and whispering to the rocks and everything, you know. And the wind coming in, pristine wind on your face, nothing like it. Is there an urgency then sometimes to your paintings that you want to capture that yeah, moment yeah, before it passes? Yeah, you got to capture it right away. Yeah. you got to get there and get the brush out as fast as you can. Mix up the paint and get get it roughed in on canvas. Yeah. And then you click it with the palette knives then. Yeah. yeah. But then that's when the music starts yeah. and the orchestra stops. <laughs> music that you, only you can hear at that point. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Someone said to me, well, how do you know when to stop a painting? Well, I said, when the orchestra stops playing, I stop painting. Amazing. The outdoor orchestra. Yes. Yeah. When you paint, Clifford, are you painting the present or the past? I'm painting the present and the past, but mostly now in my work, I go around Newfoundland, I search for the past. Someone said to me last year, I was telling a story to a guy from Ontario, and he said, who's going to be around in 30 years to tell the stories of Newfoundland and their culture and heritage? And I thought about that, and it's really sad when you think about it, because people today don't think about that stuff. They're past and everything. You know, they're not yeah. taught that in the schools, I suppose. Yeah. Well, my ancestors used to tell me stories, and the stories were what made me feel alive. And even today, they're so ripe. The, the, the people that told me the stories are, are still sitting by me. Mm. If I'm not painting, they're around me, you know? Mm. In my own mind, they're there. Yeah. When I look at your, at your paintings, I have a sense that even though they're land and seascapes and and often don't have anybody in them, technically, I have a sense that they are infused with the spirits of the people who inhabited those spaces. Is that a fair statement? Well, I can feel the people there when I'm painting. You know how I went over to Bull Arm that time? Yes. I went back there the other year, and I sketched that old house up around the hill, and I, and I put my father and me as a young boy walking up to that old house. Mm. And you mentioned uh, Bull Island, and of course you and I first met, I think it was around 1990, and I interviewed you for a TV feature. We traveled to, to Bull Island, and uh, we were with uh, archaeologist Ingeborg Marshall. So we had the artist and the archaeologist both searching for the past in that place. Yeah. She was looking for, for evidence of the, the original peoples there, the Beothic. And you, of course, as well, were trying to capture images of the Beothic. And it was believed they summered on that island. And you said, and I never forgot it, you yeah. said at the time that you could feel the presence of the Beothic as you sketched. Yeah, I could because, see, I was over there in boat with my brother and father. And when we stopped the boat, I could feel the presence of the people that lived there. So that's how I come I told the, ca the man was by my wood stove, was a cameraman with CBC, and he told the CBC. And away we go, and Ingeborg goes and gets a psychic to put her finger on the map where she taught the the, the Beothic were the, the first settlers mm. of Newfoundland. Of course, we weren't first settlers, but they were. So, well, lo and behold, we weren't there any time before we found the, the flint and the chips from where they were making tools. And my sister-in-law, Mary, was walking up the beach having a smoke, and she picked up a Dorset Eskimo arrowhead that was 3,000 years old. So the feeling was right, wasn't it? Yes, yes. So we had the scientific proof, but yeah. we also had the feeling the certainty deep in your spirit yeah. that that's where they were because you were actually drawing images of the Beothic. Yeah, while well, they I were was there. drawing images of their, of their teepees and everything. I could see that the, the, the way the site was set up years ago, you know, when they were digging and everything. I got, I got into that because of Ingeborg. You know, in my history, mm -hmm. our history, uh, I was there to preserve what I could of the people that were here before. I felt sorry for what happened to them all. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I was there. Yeah. So you were memorializing them yeah, and immortalizing I them. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to take any part in uh, saying that I was trying to find them. I was trying to find where they lived and everything because I had a respect for them. Mm -hmm. Because we made away with, them, with most of them, uh, probably all of them, <laughs> with yeah. TV and yeah. guns and muzzle loaders and everything like that. So yeah. You were trying to capture them in the best possible way. Yeah, I was. I was oh, trying to bring back their history and make people aware of where they were. Yeah. Not too many people back then was looking into that stuff. Mm -hmm. But Ingeborg was dedicated to her research. Yeah. How important is it to you to preserve our past cultures? I mean, th those of the first peoples, but also, you know, the, the, the history of two, three hundred years ago when people came over and settled and eked out a living on the land and see. How important is it to preserve that? Well, that's what I'm doing, I think, with my work. If I'm painting some old house or something like that, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the, the gardens and everything like that, you know, like in the rock gardens and everything, 
You know, you can feel the presence of those people, and you want to capture it the best way you can. And I capture with lots of color now. Mm. I bring it alive, you know. Yeah. So you're honoring the past. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's listen now to your second requested song, and it's Pat Murphy's Meadow, and of course, a very well-known Newfoundland song. And uh, when we come back, I want to talk to and about Clifford George, the mad storyteller. Here we go, Pat Murphy's Meadow. The autumn days are here again And the night winds chilly blow The woodlands turn to golden hue And the harvest moons aglow To hear again of days long past to come no more I know When I'm out Pat Murphy's meadow In the sunny long ago I see again the ocean And the distance sails afar As the maiden in the meadow strikes up dark luck Nagar There was music soft and tender in the winds that whisper When I'm old Pat Morphy's meadow in the sunny long ago. Where are the happy boys and girls that danced the gay quadrille? Or the singer who warbles sweetly The burning granite mill To hear again at sunset Where sweet afternoon waters flow When I mowed Pat Murphy's meadow In Days are about a memory Like the snows of yesteryear And when evening shades are falling All alone I shed a tear On my cheek I feel the soft touch Of the wind that whispered low When I'm old Pat Murphy's meadow In the sunny long ago Pat Murphy's meadow, such lovely images in that song and such a simple story, you know, about the sunny long ago. My guest today on Going Strong is Clifford George, one of the province's premier visual artists, but he is also a storyteller. And Clifford, Newfoundland was a nation of storytellers, and years ago every community had one, or more than one, who could spin a good yarn. Why do you think that was? There were so many storytellers. Yeah, well, I showed up in St. Brothers this weekend and sat on a fellow's patio. I went in seconds. There were people there telling me stories just the same way, telling me stories about ghosts and yeah. fairies and everything of long ago, right? Yeah. 
Well, in those days, I mean, it was the entertainment, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, my father told me he used to go see my mother up in Greensider when he was courting. And on his way home, when he got to the old railway trussel, where across the road, there was a woman that came out of the woods and got an old by the cuffs, he called it, his mitts, and took his hand and, and, and accompanied him and didn't speak until he got down to the big bridge where the river crossed under the bridge, and then she squeezed his hand, and then it, that'd be a good night, and when he crossed the river, spirits can't cross the river, see? So then he was alone the rest of the way, but he was halfway home. He said every time he came home in the evening, he saw his woman wouldn't meet him. Is that right? Yeah. So is that why you became a storyteller, listening to the older folks telling the stories? Yeah, telling the irons, nighttime to the dark of the night. The old people frightened me, so I got would be scared walking home. I used to be scared walking by the stable door because I was afraid something was going to jump out of it. You know, it grab me and kill me on the way home. <laughs> I got lots of stories. Yeah, and, and some of them sound a bit scary. So, I mean, are Newfoundland stories and your stories, I mean, drawn from real events or are they pure fiction or is it impossible well, to tell the difference? Well, impossible for me to tell the difference. <laughs> but but uh, uh, there's one about Uncle Gabe and, and I can't get into that whole story, but uh, he knew when he was going up in the jigging hole that night to go jig, squid jigging, that when he put his foot in the boat, the boat went down before his foot got there. The boat went down about four to five inches on its own. A ghost got in the boat with him. My goodness. And when he found out later on, I can't get into the whole story, but he put in the shore on the beach because he couldn't he couldn't jig squids with the man in the boat. So he said to the ghost, you got to go. So he put him in the beach. So the next day, he didn't tell his brother he saw, uh, when he put him on the beach and looked back, he couldn't see him before that, and he saw the ghost, was like, like, just like playing his day, was his own brother, Mike. just before dark. Mike. But the next day, when he went out fishing on the trawling grounds, his brother died in the boat. I mean, Clifford, I have a feeling that you and I could do another whole show or more just on these kinds of stories, you know? Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. If there's <clears> anybody... <throat> who personifies going strong it is you you're now in your 70s you show no signs of slowing down with either your painting or your storytelling i mean what keeps you going that's what keeps me going storytelling listen to other people meeting new people and painting on the roadside someplace yeah, yeah. every day is a new place a new story a new beginning yeah it's always somebody there to tell you a story you know they come over telling me stories now because they know i tell stories eh? yeah yeah and you capture the past as well with yeah. both your your words and your yeah. paintbrush. Well, like the little boys I met out there in, in Redcliffe, and the grandfather who was, um, he says, Clifford, tell him a story. But he didn't know me, didn't meet me before. But they were all coming up in the hole, and I told him, I said, you know, that's an old cellar hole, all right. But I said, there's bones down there of, your, of their ancestors. And 3 o'clock, 3.30 this afternoon, their tokens come up and go around the community <laughs> in search of, in search of their... Their ancestors, you know. Oh, my gosh. I'm thinking they They might looked have... at me like I was nuts, and, and they probably kn knew it. <laughs> they were different. The young, young people today are not the same as they were back then, you know? Yeah. Tell them a story. you got to tell them fast because That's there's right. no good for me to tell them the story, but the old woman's going to get her pig to mark before midnight. Yeah. Because that takes 20 minutes. Yeah. No, and we got one minute left, but I'm, I'm thinking that, that maybe Clifford George needs to come with a, with a warning label now sometimes when it comes to storytelling. You better watch it. <laughs> but listen, I can't let this go. I can't think of a better way to end this, this uh, interview and this program than with a couple of seconds of a good diddly because you're you're a good one. So but my father was a diddler from the lumberwood. See, now what do I mean by diddler? Da 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 da